If you like Ship Chat, consider supporting the channel further through my membership scheme. I'd like to specifically give thanks to my new Centurions, Captain's Quarters, Guillermo Martinez, Arian Fulton, and Martin McConville. Thanks to you guys, I can continue to make the content that you all enjoy. Right, today we're going to be taking a look at the Katinga class, and more specifically, I want to talk about this Dominion War variant. The Katinga class itself is, of course, too much to really talk about in a short-form video, but today we are specifically looking at the Dominion War variant that we see fielded. Now, in real life, we first see these in DS9's Way of the Warrior, and it's always very interesting to read about the special effects and how they were done for Way of the Warrior. They have these large battle scenes, of course, with many, many ships, and they also blow them up in quite spectacular fashion. So, as a result, instead of going for the large model, they instead opt for commercially available AMT ERTL kits. And this actually explains a discrepancy which appears on screen although it may just be a product of the lighting, but that some of the models look like the Kronos 1 variant in that sort of reddish tinge, and the others appear to be in the motion picture greenish-grey colour. Now, I don't know if that was necessarily just a trick of the lighting or because they were using a multitude of different kits. Now... The main reason I want to talk about them is the different effects. One of my fans, Don't Drunk I'm Shoot, which is a great name, um, took issue with the fact that in the Battle of Arcadia video, I showed them using the red disruptor beams emitted from the torpedo launcher, which he chalks up to being a continuity gaff. And while oftentimes I, I'm the first to point out continuity gaffes or the VFX guys just getting things straight wrong. To me, it seemed too deliberate for a multitude of reasons to just be chalked up to that. And it can make sense from a law perspective. So firstly, I'll explain why from a VFX standpoint, I think they did so. So first, it's worth mentioning that we only ever see the Katinga, even though it notionally has all these other weapons in all the films, we only ever see the Katinga use it's torpedoes. Now, in Next Generation, it does use disruptors. In Renunion, uh, we do see it use its disruptors, but that's basically superimposed effects on the shots used for the motion picture. But aside from that, in all the rest, we will only ever see the Katinga fire from its torpedo launcher. So, when it comes to them bringing it back in Deep Space Nine, it makes sense that they'd refer back to that. Now, it's also, I think, intentional to distinguish it from other ships. It's a very unique weapon it has. It's, it's a red beam. No one else has it. And I think that was a very deliberate decision. The Klingon birds of prey fire these uh, green pulses, you know, rapid fire. The Vochars fire these long uh, beams. And so, I think in order to distinguish the Katinga, they gave it the red beams to show that it's a little bit different, and so that you can actually see who's shooting at what in the battle sequences. So I think there is a practicality standpoint to it, and while you might say, well, it should have shot them from the other firing points, those firing points have never been used. That would look weirder in many respects. So it does seem to me an intentional design choice rather than a continuity gaffe. Right, in-universe... So the Katinga really falls out of service in the 24th century for the reasons that it is simply outclassed by things like the Excelsior and Ambassador. Badly. Uh, and it is placed into reserve. There are just whole... And there are huge numbers of, the, of these reserve ships that the Klingons have, and the Katinga makes up a sizable portion of them. There's just endless uh, starship depots just filled with Katinga ships. Now, they, of course, reactivated and re reactivated and refitted for the invasion of Cardassia in order to bring up Klingon numbers. Now, obviously, their 
their armament is from the 23rd century. It's simply not going to be up to scratch. Bear in mind the fact that it was built as a battle cruiser, but by 24th century standards, it's just a destroyer in terms of size. It's tiny by 24th century standards. So it's going to be too small to hang with the big ships and too slow to run around with the small ships. So it really lands itself in a difficult position. The disruptors are simply not up to par anymore. They're too small, especially when you compare them to the ones on the Vocha. And torpedoes are not as important in combat. We see Klingon ships using torpedoes, uh, preferring to use torpedoes throughout the 23rd century. And that's to do with the, I think, the range of the weapons, the slower speeds of the time that meant that long-range torpedo exchanges were far more common, rather than carry on with the torpedo launcher that is frankly, it's useless, and anyone who considers, anyone who says that the, the, the Katinga was up to par, unupgraded, is talking absolute twaddle, no ship from the 23rd century was, and certainly not one that, bear in mind, was actually built in the 2250s. Simply absolute twaddle that. So instead, they refit the torpedo launcher with a lance phaser. Now, without girding into it too much, there's no one thing that is a lance phaser, but it's a broad category of weapons that are largely in the Federation and the Klingon Empire. They're derived from, from mining phasers designed to cut into large asteroids. The Federation are the first to actually employ this. Freedom class one of the Freedom class ships at the Battle of Wolf 359 was carrying a, a mining phaser with it and used it against the Borg to surprising success, although ended up not mattering in the end. But the logs from that battle showed the effectiveness of, of this mining phaser against large, slow-moving targets and their ability to bore deep into enemy hulls. And so, as a result, the Federation went on and developed the Lance Phaser from this phaser drill design, making it more weaponized, giving it better range, uh, making it into a genuine ship-to-ship -ship weapon. The Klingons see this and really develop their own based on Federation mining equipment that was, that was uh, given to them as part of the Kitamura Courts, which is why, actually, Federation and Klingon lance phasers are very closely related. So while they're related, they're still slightly different, but that is the broad category of a lance phaser. They are long-range artillery weapons. Uh, they are largely intended for use against enemy fortifications and static targets. You can shoot at enemy starships with them, but and they can be absolutely devastating, but on their own are more for anti-fortification, anti-stations. Now the Katinga will make use of this lance phaser in its own unique way. In the patrol and picket role, the Katinga is able to act as a sort of a hunter-killer. The lance phaser is an incredibly powerful gun and can easily pierce th straight through the hull of a starship, uh, especially if the shields are down and even with shields up they won't last particularly long. So, if a Katinga decloaks and fires its lance phaser, it's likely going to destroy that enemy ship very easily. So, it makes it very good as a sort of hunter-killer and ambush craft. It's very good at lying in wait and attacking very quickly with a very powerful weapon and destroying the enemy before they have a chance to react. In a larger scale battle, the lance phaser and the Katinga acts more as a mobile artillery. Unlike some other contemporaries that will use the lance phaser, the Katinga is rapidly redeployable. Now, because of the nature of the lance phaser, you do have to slow down. You can't really move very quickly and you don't really have many other weapons with which to defend yourself since all your energy is going to be channeled to the lance phaser. So, they don't fare particularly well in close quarter battle, but at long range, it is absolutely devastating. And the Katinga, being able to move reasonably quickly for a ship of its age, 
is able to rapidly deploy and redeploy into batteries that can concentrate fire with devastating effect against enemy formations. It's an absolutely lethal weapon and provided they're well supported, they can wreak absolute carnage on enemy fleets. As a result, the Katinga will see service throughout the war in this role, not only, of course, anti-fortifications, but also its role as ambush and its role as artillery in pitched battles. And it's really a good example of adapting an old technology to stay relevant. You compare it to its contemporary in the Miranda, and while the Miranda was upgraded, it never really saw a shift in its role. And that can perhaps be argued for why it doesn't fare so well. It's a destroyer, but it was built to be a light cruiser. And so when it gets used as a destroyer, it doesn't really live up to what it's expected to do. Whereas the Katinga, they take a look at this very old design. They really have the benefit of fresh eyes with it, since it largely dropped out of use. And they look at it and they say, okay, how can we make this fit into modern doctrines and keep this ship relevant, make good use of it, minimize its weaknesses and capitalize on its strengths? And that's what leads them to upgrade it with this Lance Phaser and really completely transform it into a almost entirely new ship. The exterior is, you know, the same, and most of the other systems are the same, but just by changing out the weapon system, it's a dramatically different ship with a very different and unique role, and one that is absolutely critical for the Klingons. And it's a, certainly it's a very good example of how to adapt old technology and keep it relevant and sometimes that just means making an making a change in the thing itself it's all very well and good saying if it ain't broke don't fix it but it's also worth admitting that you're not as young as you used to be